I'm going to go through this example problem where we apply thermodynamic property relations to a closed system that is modeled by a non-ideal equation of state. So the problem statement says that one mole of carbon monoxide is initially contained in one half of a well-insulated rigid tank. And so on this, in this one half of the rigid tank, its initial temperature is 500 degrees Kelvin and it takes up a volume of one liter. And on the other side, there's another volume of one liter in a vacuum. So it says the barrier between the two sides, it ruptures, and all the gas from the one side equilibrates into the rest of the tank. And the, the van der Waals equation of state is used to model any non-ideal behavior. And the first thing it asks us to find is the initial constant volume heat capacity of the initial state. So the first thing we're going to do is draw a picture of the situation that we have. So this is the situation that we have here in the problem. And the first thing we're finding is the constant volume heat capacity of the initial state, so on this side right here. And it gave us that the gas behaves according to the van der Waals equation of state. So we're going to need to calculate the constant volume heat capacity as if it were a real gas and not ideal. So I'm going to use equation E5.3D in the textbook. It gives an expression for the constant volume heat capacity of a real gas. This equation given in the book shows us that the constant volume heat capacity for a real gas is the ideal constant volume heat capacity plus a term that will correct for the non-idealities. So to solve for this non-ideality term, I'm going to take the partial derivative of pressure with respect to temperature from the van der Waals equation of state that we're given. So when you take this derivative, the first derivative with respect to temperature is R over the molar volume minus B. And if you take the derivative again, you just get zero. So in this case, this non-ideality term is going to be zero. So we can cancel out all this, and that in this case, initially, the heat capacity of the real gas is going to be equal to just the ideal form. So from here, we know at ideal conditions that the constant volume heat capacity is going to be equal to the constant pressure heat capacity minus constant R. So if you go to the back of the textbook in section A.2, you'll find that they give you an expression for the constant pressure heat capacity of carbon monoxide. So if you write that out, this is the form that you'll need for the constant pressure heat capacity that you can just plug into this right here when you calculate for the constant volume heat capacity. And I'm going to plug in the numbers that they give you in the back of the textbook and that the temperature in this case is the initial temperature of 500 Kelvin. When you plug in all of the numbers from the book, you get this as your final answer. It's going to be 21.4 joules per mole Kelvin. So in part B, it asks us, do you expect the temperature to increase, decrease, or remain constant? Justify your answer with molecular arguments. Be specific about the nature of the forces involved. For this situation, this tank is rigid and insulated, so there's no work being done to the tank, and there's also no heat transfer from the surroundings into or out of the system. So this means that from the first law, there is no change in internal energy of the system. And to make the argument on a molecular scale, we know that initially the gas is contained in the half of the tank with one liter, and then all of a sudden the side is ruptured and there's a larger space that it can occupy. So with the larger space, there's now going to be a larger potential energy because there's going to be more space to occupy, more space to take up, and for them to bounce around inside the walls. And since the change in internal energy must be zero, that means that if the potential energy increases, the kinetic energy must decrease, which means the molecules are essentially slowing down inside of the tank, which is going to be associated with a decrease in temperature. 
So part B, the answer is that we would expect the temperature to decrease. So for part C, it asks, what is the temperature of the final state? So you already know that it's going to decrease from part B. We just need to calculate the exact value for the final temperature. So in the transition from the initial to the final state, the gas undergoes a change of volume and some change of temperature. So it's starting at an initial temperature here, an initial volume, and final volume here, and the final temperature. So I'm going to draw that on a volume temperature diagram. So this is what our change from initial to final state looks like on a volume temperature diagram. So in this case, the gas is non-ideal, so it would be very hard to calculate the change in temperature in one step from the initial temperature and volume to the final temperature and volume. So what I'm going to do is come up with a hypothetical process that will make our calculations a lot easier. So the easiest one in this case is to imagine that we're going to break this process down into two steps. One, we're going to cool the gas at constant volume. And the second is going to be to expand the gas at constant temperature. So these two steps will make our calculations a lot easier than if we were to do it in one big step from initial to final. So I'm going to label this step A and this step B. And from part B, we know that the ch total change in internal energy of the system from initial to final is going to be equal to zero. So we can say that the change in internal energy from step A plus the change in internal energy from step B is equal to zero. So to calculate the change in internal energy from parts A and part B, I'm going to use equation 5.36 in the textbook that initially comes from that the internal energy is a function of temperature and volume uh, and through derivations you can obtain this equation but I'm not going to go through the derivations I'm just going to write equation 5.36 straight from the textbook so this is equation 5.36 from the textbook and if we look over here at step A we know that the it's a change in temperature at constant volume so this term with dV right here is just going to be zero because there's no change in volume in step A of the hypothetical process. So I'm going to simplify this equation here. This simplification comes from what we found out in part A, that constant volume heat capacity is just equal to constant pressure heat capacity minus the gas constant R. I'm going to simplify this even further. Once we get to this point, we can plug in the numbers from the back of the book and solve the integral to get it in terms of just the final temperature. So once you plug in all the numbers and solve the integral, this is what you get for the change in internal energy of part A. So since we have this in terms of constants and the final temperature, this is all we need at this point. So the next thing we need to do is solve for the change in internal energy at part B. So in part B, it's an isothermal expansion of the gas. So I'm going to write this equation 5.36 again. And in this case, the dt term is going to cancel out and we're going to have to evaluate this dv term instead. So in solving for this term we found that dp over dt at constant v was r over molar volume minus b. We found this in part a so if you pl we just plug that in for this term right here and we can also substitute in the van der Waals equation of state for the pressure. So when you substitute these in, you get that these two terms are here, just cancel out, and that you're just left with the integral of A over the molar volume squared. 
So here we can immediately calculate the molar volume at the final and initial states. So initially, the gas took up a volume of one liter, and there was one mole of gas. So we know that one liter is equal to 0 0.001 meters cubed divided by one. So this is just going to be 0 0.001. And then once it expands to the two liters, this molar volume final is going to be 0 0.002. Now that we're here, the last thing that we have to solve is this constant A from the van der Waals equation. So calculating the constant A is relatively simple. You know this equation already from the van der Waals equation of state. You just need to look up the critical temperature and the critical pressure. And for carbon monoxide, critical temperature is 132.9 Kelvin and the critical pressure is 34.96 bar. So you plug those numbers back into this expression right here. Make sure you convert from bar to pascals, which is what I did right here, and you'll get the value of A is 0.147. So if you take this value of 0.147, plug it in up here, and this is all you need to calculate the derivative. You can even just plug it in your calculator, and you'll get that the value of this is 73.5. So now this is all you need to calculate the final temperature. So we know that the sum of the change in internal energy from step B and step A is going to be equal to zero. So if we add 73.5 and the term for step A, this whole big term that we got up here, if we sum those two and set it equal to zero, we can use an equation solver to calculate for the value of Tf. I'm not going to write it out. But if you plug it into Wolfram Alpha or anything like that, you'll get that the final temperature is equal to 496.7 Kelvin. And that's your final answer. So now all we have left is part D. Part D asks, what is the entropy change of the universe for this process? So we're going to have to apply the second law. So this is the second law, and we know that there's going to be no change in entropy of the surroundings. So the entropy of change of the universe is just going to be equal to the entropy change of the system. So I'm going to use another equation straight from the book for this one to help us solve the change in entropy relatively easily. So if you wanted to derive it from some starting point, you would use the fact that the entropy is a function of temperature and volume, and you could derive this equation, but I'm going to step, skip the derivation and just go ahead and write equation 5.31. So solving this is going to be pretty easy. We already know this from part A, and we already know this from part A, so we can just plug in what we had from there. So this is what you get if you plug in everything that we already know. So from this big equation right here, all that we actually need to solve is for this constant B from the van der Waals equation. This is how you would solve for the constant B. It's just R, critical temperature, over 8 times the critical pressure. If you plug in those values that we already know, you'll get that it is 3.9507 to the negative fifth. And if you plug in this value for B and solve for this equation, we will get the final answer that the change in entropy of the universe is 5.79 joules per mole Kelvin. And this is the final answer for part D. I hope this video helped you understand how to solve this problem and that it helped you learn more about applying thermodynamic property relations to non-ideal equations of state. So if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe and we'll hopefully be uploading one video a week for thermodynamic homework help in Chemia 211 at Purdue University.